Good evening, everyone. My name is Nancy Rubenstein, Del well, it's Nan Nancy Rubenstein Gottstein, and I'm Educational Director for the Law Project for Psychiatric Rights and also Volunteer Coordinator. And I want to welcome you tonight and first and foremost thank the Mental Health Trust whose generosity has made this evening possible. Um, and I want to talk about our speaker this evening, our very, very special guest, Laura Delano. As a psychiatric survivor I'm and an activist, I have to tell you that what I think of more often than anything else is who's going to carry on this work and who is going to have that kind of vision? Who's going to lead us? And um, I've known Laura for a while, but I honestly believe that she is one of those leaders, and I'm very excited for you to listen to her. Laura has had a very distinguished last few years, um, and she sits on the board of the International Society for Ethical Psych Psychiatry and Psychology, and she, she was the originator of the Madden America Film Festival, which was a gargantuan enterprise, and uh, that was in Massachusetts this past year. And she's also on the board of the National Association for Rights Protection and Advocacy, NARPA, which has a great Facebook page, everybody. Um, and her, I think we, a lot of us also know her from Madden America. So I want you to please welcome warmly our guest, Laura Delano. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, it's really good to be here tonight. And um, as, as Nancy mentioned, I, I too would like to thank the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority and, of course, Jim Gottstein and the, the Law Project for Psychiatric Rights and Nancy, Nancy Gottstein as well for bringing me here. Uh, it's really good to be here. Um, and, I'm, and I'm grateful for you all being, to be here as well. Um, over the next hour, I'll be talking with you about my, my journey into the mental health system and out of it, and some of what I've learned along the way. At the end, I'll touch on the concept of recovery, uh, a word that means very different things depending on who's speaking it and what belief systems they carry. I'll share how my own understanding of the word has evolved over time uh, and what it means and does not mean to me today as an ex-mental patient and why I believe this word is inescapably political. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to clarify some of the language that I'll be using today, um, because I think the meaning of the words we choose to speak is really important. Uh, when I say mental patient or ex-mental patient, I mean the identity I took on that led me to see myself as having a lifelong mental illness requiring lifelong treatment. Uh, in, in the system. And when I say the system, picture it with a capital T, capital S, uh, I mean the complex of institutions and industries that comprise the entity we call the mental health system. They include psychiatry, psychology, and social work, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, physical spaces like hospitals, clinics, prisons, schools, and universities, uh, and the invisible spaces within us and between us where we house concepts like mental illness and mental health and, and how these concepts shape the way we understand ourselves. Uh, lastly, when I say psychiatrization, it's a big word, one of my favorite words, uh, I mean the process by which a person is brought into the system to become its patient, uh, whether that happens through psychiatry, psychology, social work, the school system. Uh, so now the, the language preamble is over. The first time a psychiatrist told me I was mentally ill, I was 14. I remember, I remember that very well. I remember being dropped off at Dr. P's house after school one day uh, for that first appointment and how I nearly exploded with rage as I walked up the steps to her house. I hated my parents for sending me there and I hated this doctor I hadn't even met yet. But more than anyone or anything else, really, I, I hated myself. I slouched in the chair in her waiting room that day, hunching my shoulders and crossing my arms tightly over my chest. This was my way of saying screw you to the world in those days, and perhaps also my way of trying to hide from it. Because really, I was terrified. Terrified of the thoughts I was having, the feelings I was experiencing, 
and of what I'd concluded it all meant for me and my future. But I wasn't yet fully in touch with this fear. Mostly, all I felt then was rage and despair. Uh, but I'm jumping a bit ahead of myself because I'd actually first met the system a year earlier. On the surface then, everything appeared okay. I was an upper middle class kid who had good grades, was an accomplished athlete and president of the middle school, and was respected among my peers and teachers. But one night at the start of that school year, something happened to me that would forever change the course of my life. As I stood there brushing my teeth in the bathroom mirror, the edges of my vision started to blur until all that was left was my face in the glass. My arms started to feel blurry too until they didn't feel like mine anymore and then they disappeared altogether. I kept staring deeper and deeper into my eyes when suddenly, out of nowhere, there she was before me, a stranger. I closed my eyes tightly and opened them to see if she went away, but she didn't. This strange girl was staring back at me unwaveringly. I was completely freaked out, and after desperately trying to understand why this was happening, the conclusion I came up with was this. I didn't actually know who I was, and never really had. I'd been tricking myself all along into thinking I was a real person, and tricking everyone else too. Really, all I was, I realized, was a pawn, manipulated by my parents, my school, my town, everyone, to perform a certain way, to look a certain way, to be a certain girl. And now it was too late. I was already 13 years into my life, into this fake life, and I'd missed the chance to be an authentic person. I, was pow I felt powerless to make myself feel real. I left the bathroom that night, still convinced of all of this, concluding I couldn't share what had happened to me with anyone. I was sure there couldn't possibly be another person in the whole entire world who was in the same boat as me, or who could even begin to understand what I was going through. So I tucked the experience away as best I could and tried to continue on as the Laura everyone thought I was. At school, I kept smiling, studying hard, and leading assembly each week as the well-respected middle school president. But inside, I felt like a fraud. Soon enough, this daily performance became too exhausting to keep up. After keeping it together during the day, I began to come home from school and explode in rages, screaming and cursing and declaring how much I hated everyone. I began to fantasize about jumping out of my third story bedroom window. Sometimes I got physically aggressive. My parents didn't understand what was going on because all they heard from my friends' parents was how polite and thoughtful I was at school and at sleepovers. But their questions and desperate pleas just made me angrier and more misunderstood, made me feel angrier and more misunderstood. Soon enough, they grew so concerned that they chose to do what almost all loving parents in American society today do when their child is struggling. They turn to the mental health system for help. The therapist they sent me to was a kind older woman, but I went against my will because I saw therapy as a punishment for me being who I was and my parents' attempts to change me. It wasn't fair, I thought. I'm the one you've made a fraud. You're the ones who've made me miserable. Why should I be forced to change? I wasn't able to recognize the love and fear my parents felt that they were doing the best they could to help me. All I recognized was that I'd been exposed to a great injustice. And as time passed, I became more alienated from my family and felt a growing loneliness in, within me when I was at school because my classmates had no idea what was going on inside of me. Eventually, the therapist concluded our sessions were not enough for me. And she suggested to my parents that I see a psychiatrist. Enter Dr. P. I don't remember exactly what I said to Dr. P in that first session, but I know I poured out a whole lot of pain. I hadn't wanted to, but I just couldn't help myself. I was stuffed full of so much agony that when she asked me how I felt, it was like she'd opened floodgates 
She nodded calmly and listened to me thoughtfully. When I finished, she leaned forward and said, Laura, I think I know what is going on here. She went on to tell me, gently, that my explosive anger was a sign of mania, my sadness a sign of depression. She told me that this meant I had a lifelong illness called bipolar disorder, and while it was incurable, it was manageable with the proper medications and therapy. She told me I could lead a functioning, productive life if I was diligent about my treatment, and she wrote out two prescriptions for me, Depakote and Prozac. She told me to have my mom call her to set up the next appointment. But what Dr. P really told me that day was that my struggles meant I was fundamentally broken and would have to spend the rest of my life trying to pretend I wasn't, trying to fit into the human race. This would serve as the first of many teachings I'd receive from the system, and perhaps the most foundational in my education as a mental patient. For a few years to follow, I refused to accept what she'd told me. I avoided taking meds, hiding them in my closet or flushing them down the sink whenever I could. And I even decided to go to boarding school in order to get away from my life and make a fresh start. But that belief in my fundamental brokenness had been planted deep in me like a seed. And by the time I arrived at Harvard University, it was only a matter of months before it would push itself out through to the forefront of my being, take hold of my consciousness, and grow. I grew up in a predominantly white, upper middle class town that afforded my classmates and me a tremendous amount of race and class privilege, but it also put upon us a tremendous amount of pressure to achieve very high expectations. I'd spent my life striving to perform well enough to get into a college like Harvard, telling myself year after year, if I just get into an Ivy League school, I'll be happy, I'll be okay, I'll be worthy. And there I was, I'd made it. And none of that had happened. I was just as lost and miserable as before. I spiraled out fast my freshman fall, sitting in the public square, chain smoking cigarettes until the wee hours of the morning with thoughts racing about the meaninglessness of my life, the nature of reality, the prison of my mind, and how everything was a social construction. I put cigarettes out on my hand to channel all the pain within me into something under my control, drank myself into blackouts, and sought out hints of meaningful social connection through lines of cocaine. I was desperate to feel happy, but nothing I tried seemed to help. I began to think more and more about death, and by winter, I'd lost all hope. Overwhelmed by my despair, I concluded Dr. P had been right all along, only I'd been too stubborn to see it. I was bipolar, and I needed professional help. I walked back to the system with my head bowed and my hands up, desperate for its promise of a solution to my suffering. It had taken all this time, but I was finally ready to surrender. I remember my first bus ride to the psychiatric institution near Harvard, where I'd spend the next 10 years as a mental patient. I was probably reading a book of Jim Morrison's poetry and listening to Radiohead, my go-to soundtrack in those days and still my, my go-to soundtrack today, uh, as I sat and gazed out the window, wondering what my new psychiatrist would be like. In our first appointment, I told him all about my shameful, impulsive, self-destructive behaviors how I felt empty and lost, how I thought about death. I told him about being diagnosed bipolar as a freshman in high school and asked him what he thought. He confirmed that based on what I'd shared, I did indeed have bipolar disorder and that this explained my increasingly unmanageable behaviors. He reassured me, just as Dr. P had, that there were medications that could help me. And with therapy twice a week, we could find ways to manage my symptoms. Was I ready, he asked. Oh, I was ready. Boy, was I ready, I said. I left his office that day and emerged from the basement steps into the bright winter sun with new prescriptions in my hand and tears in my eyes. I felt joy. I'm going to be okay. 
All these bad things I've been doing aren't my fault. Now that I'm finally ready to accept my illness and take meds, maybe they'll stop happening. This doctor is going to help me. He knows what's wrong with me and how to get me better. I will never forget the overwhelming relief I felt after accepting my diagnosis that day and the hope that psychiatrist invigorated me with. By the end of that first session, he'd helped me accept two more teachings of the system. First, that I wasn't responsible or accountable for my actions because they were symptoms of my illness. In other words, I wasn't a bad person, I was a sick person. And second, that I didn't have the power within me to change my life. I needed a professional and a bottle of pills. I became a mental patient that day, and a good compliant one at that, as if those previous years of resistance against Dr. P's message had never really happened. But when you've lived long enough with the message of your internal brokenness, and you become overwhelmed by emotional pain and a terrifying sense of powerlessness to do anything about it, the promise of a simple diagnosis, a simple solution, and the thoughtful face of a doctor whose sole mission is to ease your suffering all come together as this big, bright, white light that you can't help but welcome in to drown out all your darkness. Over the two years to follow, I diligently came to therapy, took my meds, and researched my illness. I bought a copy of the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental, Dis Mental Disorders, or DSM, and studied the symptoms of bipolar. I became skilled at tracking when I was getting depressed, which meant at least two weeks experiencing a list of five or more symptoms, including depressed mood, diminished interest or pleasure, insomnia or sleeping too much, fatigue or loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt, diminished ability to think or concentrate, indecisiveness, and recurrent thoughts of death. Check, 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 check. And mania? That meant at least a week of elevated, expansive, or irritable mood, and three or more symptoms from a list that included increased grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, flight of ideas, or subjective experience that thoughts are racing, distractibility. Check, 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 check. I read books like Kay Redfield Jameson's An Unquiet Mind and Susanna Kaysen's Girl Interrupted because they helped me feel understood and not alone. Jameson's memoir gave me hope that despite having this serious mental illness, I might one day be able to do something productive with my life. And knowing that Kaysen had walked the same underground hospital tunnels that I was walking each week filled me with a sense of pride. As the system re-educated me with the medical model of mental illness, I was internalizing this one word, bipolar, and all the messages that came along with it. It was fast becoming my identity. So where did this re-education take me? Well, as time went on and my faith in the system continued to grow stronger, my life spiraled progressively more out of control. Though I man managed to maintain relatively good grades in college, all other facets of my life fell apart. I became increasingly more isolated and alienated from classmates, felt more detached from myself and the world, and fell deep into struggles with body image and food. Two medications became three. Three became four. Eventually, I decided to move off campus in order to avoid talking to people as much as possible. And though I continued therapy diligently and even enrolled in an intensive outpatient program for so-called eating disorders, I became more suicidal. By winter of my junior year, thoughts of death had become so overwhelming that I decided to leave Harvard for a year. In that time, I experienced my first hospitalization. By that point, the system had taught me to believe my suffering was something to be gotten rid of and that I was so sick I wasn't safe to be alone. I'd been taught to stop trusting in myself and to give up faith in my inner capacity to move through difficulties and to place that faith instead in the mental health system.
By the time I managed to graduate from Harvard, my bipolar disorder had been upgraded to treatment resistant status. In other words, I was declared so sick that even the best treatment wasn't able to stop the disease's progression. My family and I were informed that while I may have gotten a degree from an Ivy League institution, we'd have to now set realistic expectations about what I might be able to accomplish with my life. I acquired a slew of new diagnoses, including social anxiety disorder, substance use disorder, binge eating disorder, eating disorder NOS, and eventually borderline personality disorder. That one's my favorite. <laughs> On the day I graduated, I left school without a single friend to stay in touch with because I'd isolated myself so much. And in the months to follow, life consisted of lying on the sofa trying to distract myself from suicidal despair with television until it got dark out when I could be begin drinking myself into beautiful oblivion. As time passed, it became increasingly more clear to me that my future held only two options treatment-resistant mental illness, or suicide. By the time I was 25, I felt left with only one option. On a cold November day, I walked to the ocean, wrote my family a goodbye letter, swallowed a month's supply of three psychiatric drugs with a bottle of wine, and felt myself get washed over by a warm wave of peace as I slipped into a coma. My time in the mental health system had brought me to the point at which the promise of death outweighed any promise of mental health care. I'd wake up days later in the ICU, devastated that I'd failed and would have to go back to the same life. I knew in my heart it was only a matter of time before I'd eventually succeed. Let me quickly summarize my education as a mental patient. The system taught me that my struggles and darkness meant I was broken. My mind, emotions, and suffering were things to be afraid of and to be gotten rid of by paid professionals who were the experts on my life. I wasn't responsible for my actions because they were symptoms of my illness. I needed to surrender faith in myself and place it instead in the system if I stood a chance at surviving. In short, through the teachings I received from the mental health system, I was educated out of my identity, my agency, and my humanity, and into dependency, fear, passivity, compliance, and helplessness, into a life sentence of hopeless mental patienthood. But while this re-education became the architecture of my dehumanization, it would also ultimately frame a doorway out for I'd eventually come to recognize that these beliefs I'd held so unquestioningly and for so long as my capital T truth were merely stories I'd been taught to believe about myself. Stories taught to me by a system that profited off of my suffering and dependency, however good the intentions may have been of those who worked in it. I'd realized that nearly everything I'd come to believe about who I was, what my struggles meant, and what my future held for me were imprisoning narratives that I had the power to let go of. Now you might be wondering, how did I come to see all of this? And what did that process look like? I see now that it began through a series of seemingly small occurrences in 2010 that forced me to reckon with the system's power over my mind, my body, and my life. The first involved a psychiatrist deciding I needed to be hospitalized when I wasn't ready to be. All I'd asked for was one more day to get my personal belongings ready. Things escalated and I began to panic and security was called and I was kindly escorted to the locked ward and given the so-called choice of going voluntarily or involuntarily. Has anyone been given that choice before? <laughs> Out there? I imagine maybe. The next was a few weeks later after I'd been discharged and admitted to a program for so-called substance use disorder. I was told I had to take a medication that would supposedly help keep me from drinking. I knew in my heart that the three weeks of sobriety I'd put together had happened by my own doing, and to be told I needed this pill to stay away from alcohol, and more than that, that I had no choice in the matter, pissed me off 
to no end. I decided to stop taking the drugs secretly, my first real act of non-compliance. Soon after, a new question began to emerge from deep within me, quiet at first, but getting increasingly louder as time wore on. It asked, what about all those other medications you're on? Who would you be off of them? Who could you be? The third occurrence happened a month or two later. I'd slept through a session with my therapist, and after reaching my voicemail twice, she decided to call the police to do a so-called wellness check on me. I was irate and absolutely shocked that she had the power to call the cops and send them to my home without my permission. I never trusted her again. I didn't realize it at the time, but these small encounters with psychiatric power had begun to awaken something within me, something vital, something I hadn't been in touch with for many, many years, a critical consciousness. I was beginning to recognize the lack of power I had over myself, the tremendous power the system had over me, and the fact that I'd allowed this to happen. I see now that I was unknowingly priming myself to have an internal awakening, and that is certainly what happened in a bookstore in May in 2010. At the time, I was on five psychiatric drugs, living with my aunt and uncle, and spending my days as an outpatient at the so-called borderline center of that same hospital I'd been going to for 10 years. I sometimes liked to stand among lots of books because it brought me back to the days when I loved to read. And as I wandered the aisles, I found myself face to face with a cover on the new releases display that spoke to me louder than anything had in a long time. On it, a head stared out at me, decorated with a long list of psychiatric drug names like lithium, Prozac, Lamictal, and Clonopin. I stared right back, compelled, as I'd been on nearly every single drug on this list. I didn't know what this book was about, but I somehow knew I had to read it, even if it meant pushing through my drugged haze. Miraculously, I spent the rest of the day absorbing chapter after chapter. I continued on into the evening. I had to. I'd found my story in the pages of this book. It was called Anatomy of an Epidemic. I imagine many of you in the audience know what this book is all about. But in case you don't, I'll summarize its message briefly, as it's been crucial to my journey out of the system. In it, journalist Robert Whitaker looks at the astonishing rise in numbers of Americans on disability due to mental illness over the past 50 years, and especially over the past 25. He asks, why has this happened? and offers an answer based on his analysis of the scientific data on psychiatric drugs, especially their long-term use. The conclusion he draws based on the research is a stark one. The science is telling us a very different story than the one we've been led to believe by the mental health system and the pharmaceutical industry. In short, these drugs are not only unhelpful for many in the long term, but they've actually been shown to lead to physical disease, obesity, brain shrinkage, cognitive impairment, social disability, increased emotional difficulties, an increased risk of suicide and homicide, and a 25-year early death. Anatomy of an Epidemic shows us compellingly that the treatment so many millions of us have been turning to for help has actually been collectively harming us. When I finished the book that day, I sat there in a daze. What Whitaker was saying couldn't be true. It, it just couldn't. Could it? Could the progressive downfall of my life over the years since I entered the system have possibly been caused not by my so-called treatment-resistant mental illness, but largely by the treatment itself? My inability to remember anything, to concentrate, to think clearly, my ever-deepening emptiness, numbness, and disconnection from everything around me, the total absence of sexual function, my inability to work, my irritable bowel syndrome and chronic joint pain and headaches, the 60 pounds I'd gained since high school, could that too have been the result of these drugs and not of binge eating disorder 
I'd been getting treatment for that disorder, primarily with more meds. I began to wonder if this is all true, if my treatment has been causing my life to fall further and further apart this whole time, does it mean I might stand a chance at a different future? My heart broke for the young girl I'd been when I first met the mental health system. But in one excruciatingly painful and incredibly wonderful day, my life went from having two options, treatment resistant mental illness or suicide, to having a third, to having a different way forward. I couldn't picture what that path might have looked like or how on earth I might figure it out. But in that new space of the unknown, there was the possibility of something else, and it filled me with a sensation I'd soon remember as hope. In the months that followed, I began to read about the science, or lack thereof as I quickly discovered, behind psychiatric diagnoses and medications, and to reflect on the powerful relationship I had to them. I thought, for example, about the way I clung to my pill bag like it was a security blanket, about the fact that besides a brief and tumultuous cold turkey withdrawal experience in college, my adult body had never known itself free from psychopharmaceuticals. I wondered what my personality would be like if I wasn't on these drugs. What would my body look and feel like? Could I possibly have interests in life again and feel real pleasure? It was excruciatingly difficult to consider these questions because they forced me to reckon with the wreckage my life had become. But they were so full of glistening possibility that I couldn't help but wonder. In the midst of this awakening, I was still driving each morning to day treatment to spend hours in groups and individual therapy. But I was now hungry for these ideas. And the more I read, the greater my appetite became. I tracked down books like Paula Kaplan's They Say You're Crazy and Joanna Moncrief's The Myth of the Chemical Cure. I underlined nearly every page of Thomas Saz's The Myth of Mental Illness. Eventually, I found the writings of Bruce Levine. Through the process of educating myself with these new critical perspectives, I was de-educating myself of the system's teachings and igniting my human spirit along the way. I discovered that despite what I'd been told by countless doctors, psychiatric drugs do not, in fact, work like insulin does for diabetes, nor have they ever proven the chemical imbalance theory. I learned that the DSM, that textbook I'd used to carefully study my symptoms, is basically written by a group of psychiatrists who talk about the things they and their colleagues see in their patients, lump these observations together arbitrarily in lists, invent labels to go with them, and then put this book out there for the world as though it were a scientific text. Despite the fact that the DSM's various diagnoses filled hundreds of pages of my medical records, no one had ever told me that the book lacked reliability and validity, which are cru crucial to research being considered legitimate. What this means, basically, is that over its 60 years of existence, the DSM has never produced reliable or accurate measures. For 14 years, the system's teachings had layered themselves over me, and now they were falling away fast, leaving me exposed to a storm of confusion, uncertainty, anger, and fear. I didn't know up from down, right from left, or truth from falsity, and I especially didn't know who I was, if not bipolar. But instead of shutting down as I might have done in the past when faced with something so difficult, I opened up. I kept educating myself and putting one foot in front of the next because I felt this compelling need to discover who I could become beyond mentally ill. This would be the brightest beacon I'd rely on in the years to come as I made my way out of the system. Soon enough, I began to test out the notion that perhaps I did, in fact, have some agency over my life, and perhaps I could, in fact, start to reclaim some responsibility for myself. I began to stir the pot in group therapy by saying things like, but isn't the DSM totally invalid? And actually, there's no such thing as a chemical imbalance. Folks didn't like that very much, including my fellow patients. <laughs> 
But that didn't stop me. For the first time in as long as I could remember, I felt like I had a voice. Prior to reading Anatomy of an Epidemic, as you may recall, I'd begun to ask myself who I might be off of meds. In fact, I'd even asked my psychopharmacologist what he thought about the idea of me trying to come off. He said, let's wait until next month and circle back to that idea. And I agreed to do so more than once until eventually it dawned on me that I didn't need to wait for his approval. After reading Anatomy, it was no longer a question for me. I knew I needed to come off. It was the most terrifying decision I'd ever made because the system had taught me to believe I needed these drugs to survive. But I eventually stopped asking for my doctor's permission and told him instead that I'd made my choice. He agreed hesitantly to bring, bring me off some, but not all of the meds. So I came off the rest without his knowledge. The fire inside of me had grown big enough that I'd begun to question everything about my relationship to the system. I'd realized that not only did I have the capacity and the right to say no to these things I'd said yes to for so long, but that doing so might just save my life. After a long career as a good mental patient, I very quickly became a non-compliant one. Later that year, I lay curled in the fetal position on my family's couch, a week unshowered, miserable and out of my mind in early psych drug withdrawal. Toxic smells emanated from my chest. Boils covered my face, neck, and back. The only emotions I was in touch with were uncontrollable rage, excruciating anxiety, and overwhelming despair. And my body was so tired during the day that it felt like I'd been tranquilized. My only relief came fleetingly in pints of frozen yogurt and hours of television. And a truth gnawed at me every single hour of every single day in the form of one thought. Laura, the past 14 years of your life didn't have to have gone the way they did if only you hadn't met the mental health system. I was in the midst of iatrogenic agony. In case you're not familiar with the word iatrogenesis, it means illness or injury caused by medical treatment. And though I was struggling to heal from, heal from pharmaceutical trauma, a beautiful new insight was getting stronger. Something catastrophic had happened to me and my pain was arising out of this. I was beginning to question the part of my mental patient education that had me believing my suffering meant something was wrong with me and needed to be gotten rid of. I was realizing, in fact, that my suffering was actually a response to what had happened to me and that there were many valid reasons for it, not only physiological ones relating to iatrogenesis, but emotional, mental, and existential ones, too. The more I came to understand the depths of my psychiatrization, the angrier I got at what had happened to me. Soon enough, that anger turned to grief as I began to reckon with everything I'd lost, my adolescence and most formative adult years, my physical health and vitality, my sexuality, my ability to be in meaningful relationships, to work and to contribute to society, my creativity and drive, myself. Overwhelmed by this grief, for a time I alternated frantically between denial, rage, numbness, and despair. I was in the throes of psych drug withdrawal for quite a long time. Undoubtedly a big reason for this was that I came off way too fast given the lack of safe information I had on how to taper, and that my doctor likely had next to no idea what he was doing, as medical school only teaches budding psychiatrists how to put people on medications, not how to come off. I survived each day as best I could, wondering how much of my struggle was from the withdrawal and how much was just me. The thought that I might come off meds, but still feel this way for the rest of my life was terrifying to entertain. But I was somehow able to trust that the only way I could find clarity on this was if I hung in there and stayed patient. 
No pun intended. <laughs> so I did, day by day, month by month, year by year, doing my best to allow all that pain in and to move through it. Whenever the deeply ingrained urge to tell myself I was sick and broken and could never endure this without professional help emerged in me, an even deeper part of me began to say, no, Laura, you need to feel this within you. This is important. Don't surrender it. At this point, it's important for me to bring up the role that privilege, and class privilege in particular, has played in my journey out of the system, for it's huge. I'll offer a couple of, of examples to illustrate what I mean. First, as I was born into a family that could keep me out of the public system, this meant I never had to go on disability, obtain public housing, or face the complication of needing to keep a diagnosis and remain compliant with treatment in order to get money to put food on the table. Second, as I wasn't able to work at all during the beginning of withdrawal, and then only part-time for a long time, I needed to be taken care of by my family, financially and emotionally. I lived with extended family and didn't have to worry about rent or bills, was given the gift of space and time to rest, heal, and educate myself with books. I had access to nutritious food and to things like acupuncture and Reiki. But even with all of these things my privilege afforded me, Getting out of the system has been the single most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. I think about this every day in the work I now do. How do we build the kinds of safe spaces, resources, and supports that I had access to as a white, upper-middle-class person so that all who wish to come off their meds or leave behind their diagnoses have the opportunity and means to do so? I don't have the answers to these questions, but we need to be grappling with them. I don't remember hearing about the concept of recovery when I was a mental patient. Indeed, the only thing I really remember hearing about was symptom management. But as I began to connect with others who were finding their way out of the system, and there are lots and lots of us, by the way, suddenly there it was, recovery, everywhere in conversation. I was excited about the idea that I could recover from the struggles I'd once believed I'd have to face for the rest of my life. The concept was revolutionary to me, actually. There are two definitions of the word recovery in the dictionary, and as it turns out, the first definition summarizes that initial understanding I had of the word, and the second, my understanding of it today. So I'm going to break up the end of this talk into sections headed by each of these definitions, beginning with the first. Recovery, noun, one, a return to a normal state of health, mind, or strength. As I mentioned, at first, the notion that I could recover from my emotional and mental difficulties was something I deeply resonated with. I'd successfully abandoned the idea <clears throat> that my struggles were symptoms of an illness, and now thought of them as so-called mental health challenges to get better from. In other words, not only was my end objective to figure out who I could be off of meds and beyond diagnoses, it was also to find balance, stability, and functionality, to find mental health. Whenever I shared my story or people asked me about what life was like now that I was in recovery, I'd say with part jest and part pride, well, I no longer even meet the DSM criteria, criteria for bipolar disorder, not like that's a real thing anyways. You see, I was still thinking the end objective was to find an existence free of intense ups and downs, darkness, angst, and pain. I may have removed the medical language of illness, disease, and symptom from my vocabulary, but I was still holding on to the underlying belief that there was something abnormal inside of me that I needed to get better or recover from. What was really driving this underlying belief? I see now that it actually goes much deeper than the system and its medical model, and right to the heart of our society. The pursuit I once felt for that kind of recovery arose out of a conviction I then had in the concept of normality itself. I desperately desire to fit in, to be normal, 
which good mental health is really just a synonym for, right? But what the heck does normal even mean? And who is really in charge of defining it? The normal I'd bought into, given the environment I grew up in, meant being high-functioning, actively social, emotionally balanced, productive, and happy. I felt ashamed that I was so sensitive to the world around me, that I cried as often as I did, and had weird or paranoid thoughts about other people, or sometimes felt like I couldn't handle being around anyone else. I couldn't wait for the day when I'd be past all of that and able to just move smoothly through life. Now that I'm finally out of the mental health system, I remember thinking, I get to recover and be normal. I had no idea that while I might have been physically free from the system, it still occupied my soul. But in a pretty short matter of time, this was to change. As my brain healed from psych drugs and my thinking got sharper, it dawned on me that if I wanted to fully leave behind the system's teachings, I had to not only abandon the ideology of mental illness, but of mental health as well. For really, they're just flip sides of the same medical model coin. Let me explain what I mean. We live in a society that teaches us through advertising, the media, conventional schooling, our government, and the health industry, among other institutions, that to live the good life, one must fit seamlessly into the status quo by being a good consumer and efficient producer and remaining happy and contented along the way. This is what we call mentally healthy, what we call normal. But the truth is, the same society is also one rife with corporate greed, corruption, poverty, war, violence, environmental destruction, chemical toxicity, racism, sexism, classism, ableism, and countless other discriminations and traumas. Should a person somehow find herself feeling sad, anxious, overwhelmed, angry, afraid, or simply stressed out by the requirements for fitting into this consensus reality, or should she otherwise fall out of sync with the status quo, she's then given the message, or comes to believe on her own as I did, that there's something wrong with her that needs fixing so she can fit smoothly back in. And what does this fixing most often mean today? Mental health care. With one in five Americans and one in 13 children, not to mention one in four foster children currently on a psychiatric drug in this country, the drive to be mentally healthy is clearly more widespread than ever before. But should we really be focusing on changing our individual selves so that we're considered normal in this current social order? Or should we instead shift our focus onto changing society itself so that it's just, equitable, and truly free? I can't help but wonder whether that night in the mirror so many years ago was in fact the start of my reckoning with these bigger questions. I see now that the 13-year-old girl looking back at me was sensitized to the powerful forces around her that shaped the way she saw herself, including consumer culture, sexism, and an education industry that taught her to define self-worth by performance, accomplishments, and appearance. But instead of entering into that crisis of identity to explore its meaning and its fundamentally political nature, I tried to shut it down altogether in order to be normal. My struggle was then further depoliticized by the medical model, and over the 14 years to follow, the system would progressively strip away each and every facet of my personhood until all that was left was a hopeless mental patient. I would lose ownership over my mind, my body, and my right to make meaning of what was happening to me beyond the language of mental illness and mental health. I would lose ownership of my right to be human, just as I was. Recovery, noun, two. The action or process of regaining possession or control of something stolen or lost. When I think of the word recovery today, it's only in the context of this definition that it makes any sense to me. For I have recovered the things I lost to the mental health system, the integrity of my mind and body, my personal agency, opportunities for growth and change, 
the meaning-making process of my life. I have recovered a sense of faith and trust in myself to be meaningfully alive in this world, especially when it hurts the most. Today, I no longer yearn to be balanced, put together, or well-adjusted to this false prophet called normality. In fact, if I had a bumper sticker, it'd probably say, fuck normal. <laughs> Today, I believe that the objective in living is not to be happy, but to have meaning and purpose. And that, to me, means I must welcome in all the facets of myself that come with being fully alive, from the lightest of the light to the darkest of the dark. Today, I no longer try to get rid of my emotional pain. Instead, I try my best to listen to the anger, the angst, the despair, for their signs of my aliveness and sensitivity to what's happening in and around me, and they're telling me something important about the world we live in. I try to channel these feelings into my activism and my writing, using them as fuel for action, rather than seeing them as ailments or problems to get rid of. After all, I can't think of a single social justice or civil rights movement in our history that was motivated by a group of people who felt happy and content with the status quo. Can you? Today, I try my best to live authentically because I'm not afraid of my struggle or of myself anymore. My answer to who am I lies far deeper than any definition, description, or label, deeper than language itself. It sits at the core of my being, where my human spirit grows increasingly more on fire as I welcome in all the pain and joy and meaning that come with being alive in this world. I look back on all that's unfolded for me since I got lost in the mental health system, and I can feel from the tips of my toes to the top of my head who I am today. I can feel that I finally recovered myself. Thank you.